Alzheimer's patients, for example, can be very healthy in their bodies, right? Yes, it's all the time, they'll, actually. They'll, they'll, they'll breathe and eat, they'll live their lives, um, but a part of them that you loved is, is not there anymore. Welcome to the Evolving Past Alzheimer's podcast. We are focused on bringing you information to help prevent from developing and improve from suffering with brain diseases like Alzheimer's and other dementias. I'm Dr. Nate Bergman, a physician and chief scientific wellness officer at Kemper Cognitive Wellness, and I'll be your guide on these sound waves. So whether you're a baby boomer who's worried that your brain wiring just isn't working like it once was, or you have a loved one with the disease, or you yourself have already been diagnosed and are wondering, what do I do now? you'll want to listen to this podcast. Each episode, we introduce you to the top doers and thinkers that are revisioning Alzheimer's, dementia, and just generally things in life's second half. If you have questions or comments, check us out on social media. To support us, go to patreon.com forward slash evolving past and consider hitting the button and becoming a patron of this show if you find these episodes valuable. That's patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, patreon.com forward slash evolving past. So here we go. Let's get better. Welcome back to the show. Uh, we have another really fascinating, kind of amazing guest. Um, Dr. Thomas Cleland is a professor of theoretical and systems neuroscience at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. Uh, his research concerns, and guys, I know we'll unpack this so don't get overwhelmed by just the, the, uh, just the, the, the background itself, but his research concerns how complex cognitive processes and perceptual phenomena arise mechanistically from cellular and neural circuit properties in the brain. And he right now is particularly focused on the olfactory system, right? And, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in the olfactory system and, and its impact on how it emerges uh, in terms of um, what we call uh, dynamic dynamical networks uh, in, in the brain. And it's, uh, it is more complicated than that, but we're gonna try to have um, as straightforward of a conversation as we can so that uh, Dr. Cleland can kind of bring us into uh, what he's seeing in his research. So first of all, welcome to the show, Tom. Thank you so much for, for being with us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, so I originally uh, found out about your work through um, through like a little uh, like a little video. It's called Oscillopathies and Dementia. And when I contacted you, it was like, well, that's not exactly what I do. But uh, but that seven minute soundbite or whatever it was, nine minute soundbite that we found was, was kind of interesting. And, and um, so can we just kind of start, we would start with an overview of kind of like brain activity, brain waves, coherence, like what what is that? And why are those important? Maybe what does it tell us in a general <clears throat> sense? Sure. I mean, I guess the, the core idea is that... Um, brains operate in time and when they send signals back and forth just like any electronic device or or even just you know communicating with other people to coordinate an event it's important exactly when things happen and we all know this in terms of of things in your brain have to happen at the same time that happen in the world right if you see something you want to see something that's happening right then but what we're becoming more appreciative of is that there's the time is more important at even smaller slices so that even, even a single snapshot of what you see or a single um, odor that you inhale, that's operating on, on that time scale, but the exact details of communication are on a much faster time scale, just like when computers talk to each other. The quality of the information going back and forth is going a lot faster than any, any of the parts that we care about. And we can see this in, in EEGs. You'll you know, talk about brain waves, right? And when you... Um, in a number of situations, you'll you can you've seen people with these sort of EEG helmets on with all the electrodes connected. And yeah, um, swimming cap and, or something like that. Exactly. Yep. And um, and what those will pull out is is sort of a, a kind of average background um, targeted to particular regions of the brain that are that are showing neurons that are coordinating themselves in time. And in my own research, we, um, we're, we do animal models and sort of zoom in very closely on cells and small systems and networks, where again, we see that neurons have built-in mechanisms to organize themselves in time. And this, there's a lot of good reasons for this. It saves energy you know, in the brain, but also it means that, there's, that everything we do, everything a brain requires to 
operate as a brain, to see and hear and think and operate and move your body around, um, is dependent on these interacting pieces that have to be coordinated on this really fast time scale. And the oscillopathies broadly are when that gets disrupted. Something fairly subtle, possibly, gets disrupted and everything's just a little bit out of sync and you get these, I mean, I think in, in the initial stages, these sort of gradual partial things where things sometimes work and sometimes don't, or most of the time you're fine, but then there are bad days and and where the, the gears of the brain just aren't quite working together the way the way they would, you would like them to. Okay. So there's sort of like, there's an accepted, just, I'm sort of checking, checking to make sure I'm tracking and sure. our listeners are, are tracking. So the brain has sort of normal speed limits, if you will, uh, right? There's sort of an accepted, you can go on the highway 40 to, you know, 60 miles per hour. Like there's a minimum speed and a maximum speed limit. And uh, brains uh, uh, somehow coordinate uh, function um, like you said, in populations or a number of brain cells uh, or all brain cells or regions of brain cells are coordinating. And there's that, there's sort of a nor an accepted normal, and then there might be um, deviations from that normal, right? So, some sometimes small, sometimes more significant. And are you studying the normal or are you studying the deviations or both? I guess <laughs> we know so little about these in detail we have we, there's lots of evidence showing that these things matter but but as some authors have pointed out there's um the brain is really diverse and it doesn't work in a single way and so you know so it's nearly impossible to come up with a you know a general um description of something that's also useful so like this particular speed of communication is important for these two regions of the brain to communicate, but you have kind of different systems for a different two, two parts of the brain to communicate. But it's, yeah, it's a little bit like, um, it is, if it, you know, again, it's sort of an analogy, sort of trying to run, um, you know, to run an office and just make sure that all the, you know, important information gets to the right people at the right time. And if you, um, miss a couple of crucial pieces of communication, and then that cascades. And then someone down the line doesn't have the information they need. And then the person down the line from that doesn't have the information that they need. And so they have to assume something and it's often wrong. And then you get this sort of, um, you can get this sort of cascade. cascade yeah, it's like the game of telephone. It reminds me of a game of telephone that, you know, like the, yes, the initial yeah. errors gets worse and worse. Um, so, but this is obviously more, it's, it's much more complicated in telephone, because of course, telephone is, you know, maybe somebody's a group of 5, 10, 15, 20 people sitting around in a circle, typically whispering a, a sentence. And you, know, you sort of go from the first person that created the sentence all the way to the 20th person. And it's always amazing to see how much the initial message um, changed. Now, your field, uh, computational physiology, it may be new for people. Uh, and, and when you talk about, well, this is not just like a game of telephone, this is, these are very, very complicated systems, very complex systems. And when it comes to studying these complex systems, can you just tell us just a bit on why you need computers to, to study these as opposed to, uh, you know, just look at the EG tracings. You know, you can get an EG and you can just scratch out a 19 or, um, you know, multiple channel EG and sort of just a human being could take a look at it. Why has um, the kind of data that you guys are trying to understand become so complicated that it's really impossible uh, to understand it without the assistance of computers? Sure. So the um, one of the big things we use com use computers for is to is because these are complex systems. There's a, a lot of moving parts. As you're, you know, as you're starting to, to say, a game of telephone is sort of like a single clear message going through all these different people. But of course, in, in the brain, you'll get many, many sources of information coming together. I mean, you know, visual and sight, or vision and sight, um, smell and, and, and hearing and sort of context. I know I'm in this place. I know these people are here. I know this is the temperature. And what you decide to do depends on sort of an, a really arbitrary and goal-specific um, calculation from all, you know, based on all, all that input and, and of course the, 
exactly the, what you want to do at the time. So I'll give you, a, to, to, to bring it down to brains, I'll give you an example from the olfactory system that I work on. Um, we sort of breathe at a particular rate. Um, and so you get an inhalation, you get sort of, a, and this, if you get odors, they come into your nose and they activate these receptors and that sends signals into the brain um, to an area of the, of the brain proper called the olfactory bulb. And the olfactory bulb does a lot of things, but, but one of the things it does is end up sort of repackaging this information from sort of this breathe in, just like gross levels of activity into this really um, fine time scale signal where instead of having many, many, many of these spikes, which are sort of how neurons communicate with each other over distances, you have a many smaller numbers of spikes that are time controlled at a very fine millisecond, one, like within a couple of thousandths of a millisecond, sorry, thousandths of a second, within a couple of milliseconds of each other. And the ones that synchronize together are the ones that get to decide what happens in the next part of the brain. You get the same sort of phenomenon in the um, what they call the primary visual cortex, which is where visual information goes um, indirectly, but 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 gets there quickly, and that's where a lot of the um, sort of low-level pieces of a visual scene get get start getting put together and and. Um, but the, again, for, for right now, the most important part is that regions of, of that cortex that are coordinated in time with each other on these very, very fine scales are the ones that get to control what the next part of the visual cortex called V4 does. In other words, these different parts of the visual scene are sort of competing for your attention. And that attention is granted or revealed by which parts of, of V1 are closely synchronized in time. So it's a little bit like um, there's activity all over the brain and you can't, you know, it's not always under very tight control, I think. People will differ with that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, what control yeah. there is, is um, these dynamical systems where parts of the brain synchronize with one another for brief periods of time. I'll just say seconds, although I'm sure it varies considerably. Um, which we presume messages go back and forth and then they let go of being synchronized with each other in different parts of the brain then take over and synchronize. So I, it's almost, I'm starting to think of it almost like a switchboard on this where very, very fast signals transfer information under the governance of relatively slower um, switches between area and area. And okay. You can see yeah. Okay. So, so we're getting technical, but I, I'm actually yeah, tracking yeah. with you, and I'm, 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 I'm wanting to dig in on this just a bit because I, I do want sure. people to kind of understand because I think it, it speaks to the, um, the, the opportunities uh, that may be available to people um, in the future, uh, and then to some degree, uh, there's you know there's there are people, uh, clinicians out there that are in an, I would call it an imprecise way speculating on this uh, and mm -hmm. using things like neurofeedback, neurostimulation, neuromodulation. We had a, did an interview with a, a Ben Hampstead from the University of Michigan who's doing a lot of work in um, you know, NIH-sponsored, NIA-sponsored uh, research uh, on um, using these kinds of non-invasive brain stimulation, uh, transcranial direct current, transcranial alternating current, uh, magnetic stimulation uh, to influence uh, some of these, some of the patterns and informational flow that you're talking about, uh, at least we think that might be uh, one layer uh, of, of what's happening. So if we shift back again, just going sort of to the higher, up to a higher, more general level for one minute, mm -hmm. um, what, what kind of changes do we think, or do you think, um, because in general, let's say, what do you think are happening in Alzheimer's? Because in general, um, what we see is that okay, so a brain has a has a certain kind of horsepower. It's able to go at the at a at a speed uh, and 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 be synchronized and coordinated until it's not able to, right? And one sign mm -hmm. of that, and the many many signs of that, and everybody's looking for what's the best sign, what's the earliest sign? Is that a is that a picture of the brain? Is that a is that a um, 
something that tells us about the functionality, uh, the, fun the way of the brain's electrical functionality, which is uh, uh, some of what your work is covering. Um, mm -hmm. From an electrical functionality standpoint, in a general level, what do you, how would you describe what's happening in, in Alzheimer's or dementia processes? Is it just a slowing or is it more complicated than that? Yeah, so I mean, so this is speculative because yeah. um, we are, you know, works work by some of the physician scientists that you alluded to is really what's alerted us that that these things matter in, in Alzheimer's and, and Parkinson's and other dementias in humans, right? Yeah. So this is this is we can now think of these oscillation, these oscillatory processes as being actually relevant to something that will help people thanks to their yeah. work. And so, you know, my end of things is is kind of the other end. It's like, so what, what are they for? You know, why yeah. would breaking, why would breaking them cause these disruptions? So, so this is my, my opinion right now is that, mm -hmm. um, what we're seeing is basically a, just breakdowns in communication is that, um, that, you know, to do any interesting act, you know, to think or to operate or to, um, you know, to put concepts together, to carry on a conversation require lots and lots of converging information, like from your memory, from sort of social cues and context. And um, I think that that disruption of, so oscillations are when we are just the observations we have that several parts of the brain are doing things in an unusually coordinated fashion, which we interpret as them communicating with each other. Okay. So when those fast oscillations are disrupted, which is sort of what we see in the in the dimensions, um, that's sort of I interpret that as evidence that these mechanisms of communication are 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 disrupted, um, and sometimes it could be in a really obvious way, um, like a major stroke or something that's that's really disrupted. Yeah. Or sometimes I think that's that, sudden. That's also that's what that's right, sort of a yeah. sudden thing. But sometimes you get these sort of incipient dementias where it just sort of, you know, it's just you sort of start fading gradually. Right. And that's what I think is like, um, it's, yeah, and, and now it's, it's wide open. There's a lot of things that can disrupt these dynamical systems um, wow. where, you know, a certain part of it is just, you know, some number of the cells have, have, have died in the extreme case, or they're just sort of dysregulated with some of the there's a bunch of intracellular components that are necessary to keep cells operating. So they may look healthy, but they're just not synchronizing properly. They're having trouble getting with the program. And if and the more of those drop out and become unreliable, the less, the lower the fidelity of the signal is. I sort of think about this. This is so interesting. I, the way I, th I conceptualize this, and I, I want to see what you think, because I Coming to a concept, sort of a consensus conceptual understanding, obviously, is the work of many, many people over the course of a, a long time. Um, but the, the way it, that I try to conceptualize this on a simple level is, okay, so let's take, take 2020 and 2021 in the United States, right, in American politics, American social culture, COVID, etc. Thinking that as an analogy to the brain, right? So most, you know, for the last 20, 30 years, arguably, it depends on, you know, where, what kind of opportunities you've had in your life. But for, for, um, for many people that listen to this show, let's say, um, there, there has been sort of, okay, this is the way we, things go. This is the way it is. This is the social norm. This is right. And even at the, even as that evolves over time, uh, by nature, right, it's going to evolve, things will change. Um, but there were things that sort of, Okay, this is how you make a law. This is how you make a soup. This is how you save money. This is how you buy. At times, there's a lot of uh, traction or momentum where 60, 70, 80%, let's say, of Americans agree on something, right? And in that case, right, so the, the signal to get things done, the momentum to get things done, the like, um, you know, a veteran comes home from war and everyone's going to treat him or her. Uh, with respect, right? And that wasn't maybe the, always the way it was, but you know, last 15, 20 years, uh, our culture has changed uh, to some degree, and that some some but part of the culture was always like that, right? But there's been this sort of the, the milieu uh, has changed to where that's the norm, right? When the situation or scenario changes, or the facts start to change, or an interpretation of facts start to change, the normal process of kind of getting things done with momentum, whether that's on a political level or as kind of a social level, it, um, 
because there's so many impacts, you know, there's so many inputs, right? There's this community and this voice and this political collection and this, it like the, their, the, the complexity of interactions give rise to what you call sort of dynamic emerging, you know, emerging or emergent dynamical systems. They give rise to all of these possibilities or all of these potential outcomes. And first we just have to observe them because we don't even, we didn't know that these were possible. Then once we are able to observe them in sort of a consistently accurate framework, we can try to make sense of, well, why are, why, why is it everybody in fear all the time? Why are people having, why are everybody having uh, trouble sleeping? Why is nobody, why can nobody find employees at this and that uh, kind of job? Why is there a supply chain crisis? Because we have some sort of fundamental way of understanding this. And so it kind of reminds me of, and, and there's work to understand things fundamentally. It's not so simple as you well know, uh, better than I, just to get the understanding, which is your work and what is the, the, the understanding. So if, to double click on this idea of fast oscillations and slower oscillations that you mentioned before, um, first, I guess I could ask if you uh, understood or agree with the analogy or have you probably have a better one, but if you, can you take us into a little bit of the fast, slow, gamma, beta with some, with some, um, with, with some, maybe some background to where you're seeing potentially what's going wrong or abnormal in, in a in a dementia uh, kind of a brain. Terrific. So there's yeah, I'm, I'm drawn in, in in two ways by by the analogy you made. Um, yeah, I guess the the first would be more general. Um, so what are the characteristics? So the different dementias, sort of Lewy body disease or Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's, they're what they have in common is this general idea of um, fast you know fast oscillations, which means the um, which tends to be these tight coordinations in time between neurons. It tends to be very sp in very specific parts of the brain, different in different parts of the brain, which we think of as very much local um, local communication. Like Do we call those microcircuits? Are those microcircuits, micro super, yeah. yep. Um, and, and also sort of inter-aerial microcircuits. This is when this microcircuit wants to talk to exactly that microcircuit and contribute its piece of information, right? Um, mm -hmm. And those we see, you know, very scattered and they're, and they're intrinsically complex. Um, as you get towards the slower oscillations, things like, like delta waves and the sort of the, um, the big, what they call the thalamocortical loop, which is just, it, in addition to being slower, they tend to be broader. And interestingly, they, they tend to go up in power in a lot of these dimensions. Now, I'll, I do want to point out that the, the th like the three dimensions I, I spoke of, the fine scale differences are different. They're, they're I hesitate to quite say diagnostic because it's you know, but but they're definitely not the same. But this, the broad idea about the fast oscillations going down is similar, and the and the slow ones going up. And the characteristic about the slow ones is they tend to be just these very broad and general, connecting large areas of the brain together in sort of a meta. You know, meta, you can think of them as being. They're not governing the quick communications that are engendering complexity. They're just. Um, I, I don't know quite what to call them because we don't really know, but a, a broad clock, slow processes. It's like a, a rhythm. A, it's a rhythm. A background on which all other things happen, but they lack the complexity to do interesting things. Mm -hmm. They can, they're, I mean, I, I assume they're part of the process. They're, I'm sure they're essential in their way, but they're not the immediate basis by which complex and interesting things happen. Right, you could have a dining room, room and a dining room table with chairs, but if you don't make dinner, set the table, put the candles on, you know what I mean? Like you're not going to have a meal. Exactly. You just have yeah. a dining room. And, and there is a tendency, and I'm, I'm stretching a bit here, but for dynamical systems to have these, um, to sort of collapse into these uninteresting, less complex states, where if you do think about the whole thing as a, and this is, this, you know, a lot of dynamical systems comes out of physics, comes out of you know branches of mathematics devoted to this. It's not all biology, right. um, but these you know, these intricate systems can just collapse into, and the most obvious is, is really Parkinson's disease, where these rhythms collapse into a you know a big single oscillation, which is characterized by the the obvious tremors, in in advanced Parkinsonism. Um, that, that's just the most obvious of things. But yes, but these these the things that get big are the sort of less complex, less sophisticated, um, more, more 
general has where and I'm, I'm trying to extend back to your analogy um, to the social world here where the when you you know if you don't have the infrastructure to bring context and understand complexity and realize that all these things don't always go together and you can't you know, broadly um, you know, use this one variable to characterize you know another person or another person's state just like you know or or the state of the world if you're speaking about the brain and your interpretation of it right. then you're missing most of, most of the interesting parts um and again it's like alzheimer's patients for example can be very healthy in their bodies right yes it's all the time they'll, actually they'll, they'll, they'll breathe and eat they'll live their lives um but a part of them that you loved is is not there anymore and yeah right so that's yeah. This is um, so. So I actually, I I actually, uh, I, I'm at a, a crossroads in, in where I want to explore this conversation. But I think I think jumping right into the work that you're doing with the smell system, the olfactory system, uh, may be instructive, and we can you know kind of extrapolate back out to the Alzheimer's. Because so I'll just share with you some, some anecdotes before we dive in, and, and and you talked about some of the work you're doing with the neuromorphic chip, the artificial nose, and oh, okay. um, some of the really interesting stuff you're talking about, and, and, and the work your lab and, and, and uh, partners are doing. Um, so I there is um, certainly, and it, of course, it's all new, because it's only about a year and a half old, and, and, and the studies on this are, are less than a year and a half old, because COVID's only really been studied by American uh, scientists for about a year and a half at this point. Uh, and certainly worldwide, we didn't have a lot of publications till uh, the, you know, the spring and summer of 2020, from my reading. And, but we saw a very, very close um, association without a real mechanistic understanding yet, at least uh, in my mind, uh, about people getting COVID. So people that would suffer from COVID and have, you know, any number of symptoms, loss of smell, uh, in particular, the taste, um, uh, and then developing neurologic symptoms uh, like a Parkinson's type of a walk or a Parkinson's tremor or uh, abnormal uh, or accelerated memory loss, this so-called brain fog, um, uh, you know, and, and on and on, right? Fatigue, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but there's, there's a and it's not the majority, uh, and, in, and in my patient population, it's, it's, a, it's definitely a subset of people uh, that have gotten COVID, uh, and they have had some kind of neurologic sequelae, meaning they've had some kind of impact in their, call it their brain function or their nervous system function. And one key feature of this, and it's not always the case, but, but it is often the case, is the smell system, the olfactory system. And just for our listeners, as I know you, you're uh, very well versed in this, uh, the smell system, uh, when it comes into the, you know, through the nose, right behind that nose, if you sort of keep pushing your fingers, if you put kind of to be uh, crass, if you push your fingers kind of through your nose and then also kind of through your ears, eventually uh, you would converge on some places that were really thought to, in the deeper brain, uh, that are really thought to contribute to the formation uh, of memory, um, uh, particularly what happens in our life, you know, the sort of the autobiographical episodic memory, um, the stories of our lives that we can remember and, and sort of remember minute to minute. Um, but they're, and they're very, like at least in space, in the space relationship with, with uh, the smell system, very, very close, if not in some places, sort of on the same highways, if you will. Um, so what can we kind of, what do you, what, what is, what is your work with the smell system and how does it sort of relate to overall brain function, uh, COVID, uh, and, and eventually we'll see if we can steer it back maybe to something about, uh, dementia, Alzheimer's in particular. Sure. Um, yeah. So one of the reasons I, I work in the, in the sense of smell besides just sort of a, a fondness for it is because it's sort of a microcosm of these, um, these larger issues, it's sort of easier to study. Um, so for example, the same sort of mechanisms, like low level cellular circuit mechanisms of memory that are in, are sort of well known in the hippocampus and isocortex. These are some of the areas we've referred to where autobiographical memory is, depends on substantially. Mm -hmm. um, those same things happen even in olfactory bulb. 
um, you know, it, so learning and memory is really distributed throughout the brain. I would, you know, our way of thinking is that the the part, the, the role of the memory that's in this olfactory bulb circuit is really about um, shaping the sort of chemical environment into recognizable odors that mean things. And they have, of course, to communicate with hippocampus and isocortex and other parts of the brain to, um, to make that into something you can operationalize and work with and understand and, and guide. But, but in terms of carving up all this possible chemical space into things that matter, that we think is what the memory that's in our specific olfactory bulb brain circuit is. And COVID, of course, is um, one of the peculiar features of it. I mean, some people have loss of smell, sort of, you know, anosmia or hyposmia, we call it. But so, almost so more... loss of smell or, or less of a sense of smell. Right. But but in some ways, even more I mean, interesting is a very nice way to describe it. But, you know, more compelling is like something that gives us more of a clue of what's happening is when they get, they get what's called sort of parosmia, meaning they, you can smell, but you smell wrong. So you're getting, your sense of sen smell is getting confused. Right. You, you, some things you love, you know, that you, that you love some smells you enjoyed are just terrible and devastating. Sometimes they're, it's just like you're smelling lavender and it's actually a sausage. I mean, just these, these persistent errors. Yeah. And interestingly, um, just for those who are listening, retraining, like sitting down, literally sitting down in sin, just smelling things over and over again um, that you know is a as good a way as any we have right now to help retrain you to, to, you know, to recognize the smells and to train yourself towards back towards where you were before COVID. So yeah. um, it's, it's genuinely worth it. But, but what I end up thinking this means is that um, this is, you know, if you're used to having these signals come through the olfactory bulb that sort of packages them up and says, okay, this is an example of X, this, this category, this meaningful odor of this is a sausage or this is a bakery or this is the smell of the home where you grew up. Um, it just gets, it sort of falls into the wrong hole because those, you know, the, what we call the attractors, the, um, the sort of outcomes of these fast time scale neural computations just goes in the wrong direction because the wrong pieces are contributing too strongly or too weakly and you just fall into the wrong hole. Yeah, kind of like when you have one of those games where you have the flat platform and the marble on it and sometimes there's little walls in the way and you're trying to guide it into this hole over here, but a small error, a small tweak at some point will send it down the wrong passageway and you'll be stuck going down, falling down the wrong hole. And do you yeah. see those errors? Like, can, so you, so in other words, you have um, person A, or you know, if you're working with animal experimental models, and so if you have someone who, prior to getting COVID, had a, what we would, I guess, let's assume that we had confirmed this person has a normal sense of spell, that the neurological impulses that you're describing these sort of complex phenomenon, electrical impulses, uh, the way that. Um, uh, all of the the nerve activity, both electrical and chemical, uh, summate or synchronize, or are you get have some momentum in a majority sort of opinion. A majority rules gets a gets 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 you know so mint smells like mint, and then uh, and that and that that has a sort of a signature or a path that can be mm -hmm. uh, seen in most people, right? Like that's how mo that's the signature or flow, if you will, of most people. And then are we seeing that when people get when they lose their sense of smell from COVID or whatever, because you know loss of sense of smell or a reduced sense of smell can be, as you probably know, an early sign of Alzheimer's as well, um, uh, or others, uh, other kinds of dementias. But like, if is do we see then on an electrical level or from this sort of complex, uh, um, the, 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 the complex phenomenon that you're describing in the brain, do we see a pretty clear aberration or aberrancy or a difference? Right, that may explain why someone is now is smelling. They're actually smelling mint, but they it smells to them like a sausage. Do we do we th see things at that level of clarity yet? We, we don't. No, and actually, this speaks to your um, your example of what good are computers? What role do they play? What role do these simulations play? Mm -hmm. um, that that sort of theory is is 
here's where you said, you know, when you're going through normal, um, you know, measuring sort of normal performance, normal, how the, normally how the system works and developing, you know, some things are very clear, some things are more, um, you know, theory has a, a, a variety of levels of certainty that you always have to keep in mind. This is almost certainly true. This is probably true. This is, I'd like to think this is true levels and and you build these models of how the system works and that gives you a clue in terms of what's easy to disrupt and what's hard to disrupt and you know what are the vulnerabilities of the system and then sometimes you're able to experiment with those and that's part of the scientific process but so that that kind of model is the um the basis for my thinking that that parosmia would be something easy to create if you just went in and had these kind of small chaotic disruptions in in cellular communication within the brain and um i, I suspect it happens most effectively or quite effectively in olfaction because that, of course that's where the coronavirus lives right so the it's in the it's in the lungs and the um, upper respiratory upper and lower respiratory tracts and you know, with with clear access to the um, nerve cells of the nose and you know some viruses are able to get in that way and get into the brain so i know you're working and again if this is too theoretical it's so outside of your comfort zone to speculate that's that that's fine because i realize that there's you know so 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 much more that's um either minimally or completely unknown that we don't have to speculate uh, if it's if it's not um, at all fruitful, but if you if you take lots of smells, so you 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 isolated the olfactory system because it's a it is a sort of a on some level there's some skills there or some some process there that can be studied on its own because it, trying to put everything and stack everything together is nearly impossible even with the assistance of computers because there's it is so complex so you kind of have to start with something so you're starting with smell. Do you have enough of an understanding about the network uh, facilitation or the circuitry um, uh, facilitation uh, of things that would give you um, a clue about why someone would experience re who is reduced is who is experiencing reduced sense of smell uh, because of COVID or something else um, would is then at higher risk, or this might be an early sign of a degenerative condition, right? Something that is degenerative, mm -hmm. where their brain is starting to sort of break down. You eventually have cells that are uh, minimally functioning, or and, and eventually we have uh, non-functioning or very interrupted functioning cells. Any idea of, of, of how you, we get from A to B or from A to Z there? Right. Um... So my, my suspicion has been, so yeah, I, I, I don't I mean, obviously I don't know, but I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily think that getting symptoms due to COVID would be pushing you further towards something like Alzheimer's or Parkinsonism, right? Um, it may, it's, if it gives you brain fog, it's sort of a maybe cold comfort, but I, um, but I don't think there's any reason to think that that's part of the same train track just because it has some of the same, you know, symptoms that are at a starter level. My, my whole way of thinking that got me interested in the, in the oscillopathies is the idea of sort of what's, you know, something like Alzheimer's disease that, that eventually becomes really recognizable and diagnostic, right? And, you know, in sort of after the fact, you can see you know, the plaques and the tangles and, and, you know, yeah, those are kind of later, right? Later yeah, much on. later, exactly. Yeah. But, um, and there has been a tendency to think, well, those are the, you know, that's the, you know, I'm going to look under the, yeah, I'm going to look for my lost wallet under the light post where the light is better, even though I think I yeah. lost it over there, because they're the, these are these very prominent, absolutely Obvious. clear symptoms, right? Mm -hmm. But of course, the real question is what, what went wrong first? What started it? And I fear that those are going to be quite subtle, that, um, that those sort of, and it might be that there's a wide variety of disruptions in communication that are not going to be in a single place or of a single type, but just have these sort of systemic effects of breakdown in communication that sort of end up going down the same tube in the end. Um, and 
so in and disrupting communication between brain areas is almost almost the definition of what would lead to dementia right the whole yeah. you know dementia almost by definition is the brain's not sending the messages it needs to send and if subtle changes in timing and and the sort of infrastructure of communication between brain areas on this fast time scale is is enough to cause that disruption then um i i I guess I'm of the opinion that that's the sort of thing that happens first. And okay. we know that our, we know that our brains are really good at compensating. If, um, if something's not working, we've got a lot of, in many parts of our brain or many you know, ways of our thinking, there's lots of ways to compensate. Where it's like, okay, I, um, I can't remember that, but I can remember these other things and sort of reconstruct the thing I need. We've all, you know, that happens to everybody, right? Yeah. Um, I can't remember the address, but I remember what road it's on, and I'll recognize the house when I see it, right? Yeah. Um, I I had a, a, a theory some years ago, which I, I don't know if it stood the test of time or not, but um, that that the cholinergic deficits, the idea that um that you get, so there was a... You know, Neurotransmitters, a, yeah. Right, that there's a loss of acetylcholine, and that was a, you know, a problem, but cholinergic replacement worked poorly. Right. So in other words, yeah. just to bring our listeners together. So, you know, about 17, what is it, maybe 18 years ago, maybe more at this point, there was an approval of medications uh, that would allow more of the um, uh, the neurotransmitter acetylcholine to be present in the connections between uh, nerve cells. Um, and it turned, you know, that was an approved medication for Alzheimer's and is used in other dementias, but it wasn't a game changer because like you're saying, it's thought that by the time you need that kind of intervention, that kind of medicine, there's so much damage to the cells that they're not, you know, because they're not viable anymore that, yeah, maybe it helps a few people for a little bit of a time, but it's way late in the, in the stage. So I just make sure everybody's tracking. Yeah. That. Oh, super. Yeah, exactly. And, um, but you know, I, what I didn't get out of is, is people distinguishing the production of this neurochemical versus the place it needs to go. And what I would, you know, my, my thought at the time was that if the system that's receiving it isn't able to receive it anymore, if it's, you know, if it's, um, we would call it like receptor dysregulation, but it basically means it can't listen to the signal. Beating a dead horse or a sick Beating horse. A dead horse right. Yeah. And then the area that produces the acetylcholine pumps it up, tries to give more and more and more and more in order to restore function. And so this might be going on for a long time without you even knowing it. And then finally it disrupts and then people, you know, look and it's like, oh, look, the acetylcholine neurons are, are burnt out. Um, but they, you know, in a, but it could be that they were never the problem. They were doing their best to compensate for the problem and destroyed themselves in the process. But the actual problems on the other end, um, that the, you know, that the, the ability to receive that, that, that signal has been disrupted. Um, so, and so this is, so this, I mean, you know, just, just to bring it around, the, the idea is that these some subtle miscommunications in different parts of the brain can um, can be compensated for a lot of things by a lot of other mechanisms. And then by the time you can't compensate anymore, there's lots of things wrong. And so it's hard to find out what went wrong first. And of course. The problem. Yeah. And of course, you know, like, who knows if that's five years, 10 years, 20 years, you know, there's all kinds of data everywhere. But from the from the world that you're in, computational uh, physiology, computational neurology, uh, um, and now this notion of oscillopathies, uh, meaning these sort of small network perturbations that um, are not well characterized over time, weeks, months, probably more like, you know, a time course, probably more, in my guess, probably more years, um, uh, maybe decades, but certainly years, uh, most likely. Um, we would think unless there's like you said like a stroke or a massive infection or something that you know massively accelerates the process is probably a slow subtle process over time um but let's say now you want to design an experiment to discover you know where what you know you want to sort of start to um parse out when this might happen right and you take a group of people that are at risk for alzheimer's or have very very mild symptoms subjective symptoms but have genetics or family backgrounds that uh, make them higher risk, what would then be the tools that you're aware of, whether you have them in your lab or 
um, others that you're aware of are doing this kind of work, what would be the the path to discovering this? The tool is this like an EEG? Is this uh, infrared uh, spectroscopy? Is the you know like what are the tools that may that seem most promising to you out there that are um, may provide sort of more information uh, and I dare say answers, right? Insights into what's happening. From people, I think that getting a, a, a lot of EEG recordings, like really like high quality EEG recordings that can target some particular you know areas of the brain effectively like with many electrodes and, and a lot of power, um, especially like in a longitudinal study where we can follow a number of people a subset of whom might end up getting Alzheimer's and a, you know, and a subset of whom would, would not, you know, because this would be a way to say, okay, what of all the changes in people's brains that happen just over, over time, and then maybe specifically over aging as well, what patterns seem to be characteristic of, um, of, of people who later begin to develop Alzheimer's disease. Um, and then we'd have to, to put this, I mean, <laughs> this is the, a big project. You have to put information like that together with sort of animal research on, on like the systems and, and neurons and circuits that uh, that actually communicate between these parts of the brain, or the analogous, the you know homologous parts of the brain in, in these um, in mice or or whomever, and try and understand at a cellular level. So what would this mean? What you know? what do oscillations of this frequency in this particular structure portend? You know, who, who does the structure need to communicate with? Um, and some of that can be general information. Maybe some of it needs to be more specific. I, um, but at least we'd know from the, the, the human um, EEG studies how, how, how heterogeneous it is, how, how diverse are the, the signals that would eventually lead to Alzheimer's. Um, and we can start in knowing a bit about and with the animal models, we'll sort of be able to, to better link. What can we do about it? If these, right. um, if these, if these areas are starting to miscommunicate early on, what can we do to sort of fix that? Um, is there, are there simple nutrient balances? Is there a, um, will sort of an equivalent of, of a Parkinson patient taking L-DOPA? Is there an equivalent that would help sort of sustain these um, these processes that wouldn't be a hugely complicated intervention? I'd like to think there is, but we'll have to figure that, that out over the next years, decades. Yeah, absolutely. And do you have any, so things that we know clinically, right? Things that we, that are highly associated, highly correlated. And, um, you know, I think it's too hard to say causative because that's requires evidence that's hard, you, know, you just can't do these the kinds of experiments uh, to, sh to show causation like uh, depression is highly correlated to development of Alzheimer's disease anxiety now insomnia uh, um, but even things like PTSD right so these are non we don't think that you know, so post-traumatic stress disorder um, that are essentially changes in the mood system or mood regulation system but seem to be, and so the theory is in a non, again, in, a, in an imprecise, non-specific way that, uh, oh, even ADHD, right? So attention, so, so there's a problem with some network or ask, so a cognitive task mm -hmm. that can maybe in 50, 60% of cases, you see the same kind of pattern under, under the hood, so to speak, yep. uh, attend the attention network and, and attention deficit, uh, uh, the something about access to the central executive network and anxiety. You know, there's this walling off and somebody doesn't have access to the parts of their brain that um, generate solutions and generate um, uh, and, and get people sort of out of the uh, the anxiety loop, PTSD, similar, mm -hmm. right? And then there's this idea of information flow from the anterior parts of the brain to the posterior parts of the brain. Um, and because you, you've made mention of the, of the work in the posterior, so the uh, thalamocortical processing and the posterior process, this sort of posterior dominant frequency where you know, the horsepower of the brain starts to dwindle uh, on some level um, over time. The, the network activity seems to slow, but it's a, it, that's, again, it's, a, it's an overly generalized understanding. So do you have a sense, uh, whether it's with the work you've done in the smell system or kind of other things you've observed uh, in, in your work or in others, 
um, which which regions, which systems, networks, or may be clearly implicated or or more likely implicated uh, in the development of, let's say, dementias, where it's like no idea at this point. We don't quite have nothing. Um, there's a uh, in, in, in this is, is not work from our lab. This is work from from the, you know, the physician scientists who, who are working with patients looking at EEGs. There are there are particular like there's a um, I, I alluded earlier to that the yeah you know, like Parkinsonism and Lewy body disease and Alzheimer's have different signatures. For example, there's this particular reduction in what's called the alpha band mm -hmm. um, that distinguishes Alzheimer's from Lewy body dementia. But again, in, there are an enormous number of studies having done this, but when, you know, those who did said, well, this, this is different. So something's now exactly what these, you know, alpha, alpha happens in a lot of parts of the brain and does different yeah. things in the different parts of the brain, but at least it's something we can grab onto. I mean, I would sort of like it. And this, this is why I, I think it's actually important to do the, um, kind of the most more sophisticated types of EEG where you can where the you have a little bit greater capacity to target to identify the regions of the brain in which the particular frequencies are, are, are coming out I mean um, I guess what I would what I would love to see from all this is um, where particular patterns of you know, changes in, in, in an individual's brain waves could be seen as this is, you know, 85% consistent about the beginnings of, say, specifically Alzheimer's dementia. Mm -hmm. um, but you've got 15 years before you're going to see any actual dementia. So that's, you know, that's 15 years of early warnings and p potentially the capacity to treat it before you have any actual symptoms that matter in your life. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I, I sort of, I have hopes that on that end, this sort of the, you know, we'll be able to get reasonably diagnostic patterns um, that will, that will, you know, motivate sort of courses of treatment well before we start saying we have to, you know, I'm becoming forgetful or I, you know, I, right. this, this, yeah, something, big, something's big changed in my behavior and yeah. in sense, because of all these com these compensatory mechanisms in the brain, by the time it starts to really affect your life in these important ways, I tend to think that it's already, you know, it's been going on for a long time already. And we want to get that time back so that we can, you know, make whatever adjustments we'll learn how to make, whatever treatments we'll learn how to deliver um, during that time. I mean, maybe we can't stop people from getting the disease, but maybe we can push, you know, push the onset of dementia um three four five in, six seven years right yeah or, or even potentially you know until somebody until passes from something else other causes yes yeah. Yeah. right right so that's brilliant that's brilliant um and i know i want to respect your time and um and start to hard stop this is a super interesting conversation you're clearly someone i could talk to all day and probably you know multiple days in a row and, and not stop uh with questions and, and learning because your experience i so much appreciate you um taking time uh, to uh to talk to our audience and try to um simplify some of this very very, very complicated stuff uh, thank you so much tom uh, more than happy to thanks for the opportunity it's good to talk to you so that's our episode i hope it was useful to you Check out the show notes on iTunes or on our website where we've summarized the key points. If you find the information here valuable, please consider giving us a five-star rating on iTunes and leaving comments in the comments section. It will really help us bring this message to as many people as we can. If you have questions or comments, connect with us on social media. Finally, to support us, go to patreon.com forward slash evolving past and consider hitting the button and becoming a patron of this show. That's Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N patreon.com forward slash evolving past. Thanks. We'll talk to you next time.